who I have everybody has other conversations with. And today I have an exciting program. Uh, with me is uh, my guest, Father Donato Infante. And Father Donato is currently the uh, associate pastor at St. Joseph's Church here in Shelton, but soon to be moving on and into a new and challenging, certainly, and exciting role. And, uh, and I share that with you because uh, our good bishop uh, has uh, asked Father to take over uh, the, as director of vocations. Uh, for the Diocese of Worcester. So, Father, welcome, and it's glad to have you here. Thanks so much for having me, Dick. And, you know, I, I, I thought the best way to start it out is, uh, uh, I, I know I was talking to the fellow who does it now, Father Jim Mazzone, who, after, I think, 14 or 15 years, is moving into parish work, and uh, he was saying he was looking forward to that. But he was very, 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 very enthusiastic and said he thinks Father Donato is going to be perfect for that job. So uh, at least we got somebody in the corner <laughs> and, and ready to go. But let's talk about that, um, the challenges that you face, and how does that all work uh, as, as you go out and find men who are willing to join the priesthood? Right, so there's really two parts to my job. I'm the director for the Office of Vocations, which works with recruiting and then assisting the men who are studying to be priests uh, for our diocese, no matter what seminary they're at, sort of accompany them on their process of formation. And then also the director of the Holy Name of Jesus House of Studies, which is a house we have in Worcester for some of those men who are studying to be priests. And there are a number of challenges. One is that we live in an age that is increasingly more secular, less religious, and so there's less interest amongst young people in becoming priests or nuns. Right. Yeah, it, 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 uh, a lot of challenges face not only the Catholic Church, but all religions. Uh, huge challenges. I, I saw an article this morning I was looking at uh, that, that, that worldwide, the number of people who, and, and it's basically young people, who just don't bother going to church. That's right. And in this country, we are not the only Christian denomination that has a shortage of those in ministry. Right, and uh, and so it's a it's a big challenge. Uh, now now let's let's go ahead a few days, and and what is your, what would your day look like? I mean I know you speak to some of the schools. That's right. So every morning, uh, I will begin with the seminarians who will be living with me, with uh, morning prayer and mass before they go off to class. Now they might be studying at different colleges or universities in the city of Worcester, depending on what their academic background is, Assumption or Worcester State. Right. Uh, and then from there, there's, every day is going to be very different. Some days I will be at the Catholic schools celebrating Mass there or visiting classrooms and teaching. Other days I might be meeting with someone who has contacted the office and wants to go on a tour of the seminary. It all is going to depend day to day and then of course some days are going to be consumed with the unfortunate cross of paperwork. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm responsible for making sure that all of the seminarians have health insurance, that all of their tuition is paid by the diocese, looking at over all of the bills and all of those things. So it's going to be, there's a lot of work to be done. Oh absolutely. I know I, I, I always tell a story but I'm the oldest of 29 grandchildren. My mother was one of 13. And my mom, my nana and grandpa came from Ireland, and my mother, my dad's mother and father were from Ireland. And every Sunday, my nana would be at the, we all went to nana's at one o'clock for dinner on Sundays. And this is many years ago. And nana would be waiting at the top of the stairs, and I'd be the first one up the stairs as the oldest. And she'd say in her little brogue, Dickie, get over here. And I'd come over, she'd say, tell nana what color the priest was wearing today. And you better know the answer to that question. <laughs> but if you got that one right, she'd say, now, tell me a little bit about the gospel. And she wanted to make sure you went and that you were paying attention. And, of course, we all went to the nuns in those days. But, but uh, she always wanted me to be the priest, you know. And I, and I remember, as a kid growing up with the nuns, we used to have things at school and little plays. And on occasion, I would be the acting priest. I'd, but I was mesmerized. Um, Back then, with we, we had Monsignor McCormick at Immaculate Conception in Everett, where I was going to school. And he would come to school and visit the kids. And he would always come and eat. In those days, they wore Berettas. 
and he had his black Beretta with his red pom-pom, <laughs> and he had his black cassock, but he had red trim. And versus the other priest, I thought he was so special that if I were going to do it, I wanted to be one of him, you know. But, but, uh, but you know, and, and my Nana was always said to me, it's you the one I wanted to be the priest. But, uh, but uh, my youngest brother, Terry, was ordained a priest, a Franciscan father, and at his ordination was in Washington. And uh, Cardinal Raimondi, who was then the apostolic delegate, ordained the, mm -hmm. the class of, was eight of them that were ordained. And after the ordination, each one came up and met with the cardinal and chatted. And my nana, in the middle of the, we're all standing around, says to the cardinal, it's him, he's the one I wanted to be, the <laughs> priest. And I looked over and I said, now nana, if I was, I'd be pope by now. And the cardinal took his red Beretta off, put it on my head, and he says, you're one step closer, pal. You know, but and my, it was funny. But let's chat a little bit about, you know, Donato Infante. At some point, and I, I'm sure, like all kids, when you were five or six, and mom and dad said, what do you want to be when you grow up? The last thing you said was a priest at five or six. That's right. It didn't really cross my mind until I was in high school. And I remember very distinctly, it was the summer between my sophomore and junior year of, of high school, and I was outside uh, praying in the front yard and trying to figure out, I've got all this time during summer, maybe I should do something with it. And so I decided to ask God, God, what is it you want me to do? And I was thinking maybe he wanted me to volunteer at the food pantry, yeah. or the soup kitchen, or maybe uh, tutoring in the summer school program, something like that, teaching yeah. religious education. And instead, this idea came to my mind, be a priest, which at the time I sort of just laughed off. I thought, who am I? I'm not yeah. worthy. I'm not holy enough. Uh, and yet, every once in a while, when I would go and pray about a situation, I'd say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? This idea always came back. And so uh, after a while, I began speaking to my parish priest, writing to some religious orders, asking, what is it like to be a Franciscan? Yeah. What is it like to be a Dominican? and reading a little bit more about it. I went to Boston College um, because I still wasn't sure whether it was what I was supposed to do, and yeah. if so, what type of priest, diocesan, religious order, right. you know, there's different types. And uh, during my time at BC, uh, I just had some, some clarity that it was supposed to be a diocesan priest from my home diocese, the Diocese of Worcester. And so I finished my time at Boston College and entered the seminary. Wow. And now, where, where, where'd you go to the seminary? So for the first two years, I was assigned to St. John Seminary in Brighton. Yep. But because I already had a philosophy degree, I wasn't really taking very many classes there. I was doing the pastoral formation aspect, but for academics, I was still walking back across the street to Boston College right. for a number of classes. And then after two years, the bishop asked if I wanted to go to the North American College in Rome. And I told him I didn't think it was for me. And he said, oh, why don't you pray about that some more? And yeah. so uh, <laughs> I went back to him and I said, okay, Bishop, uh, having prayed about it, I think it is what I should do. And so I was sent over to the North American College in Rome where I was for four years before I was ordained a priest. And then I went back for one more year to get another theology degree. So, you know, I think one of the things that I think, as a, as a person who's been a Catholic since I was three weeks old, I mean, I had no choice in that, by the way. Someone took me to, uh, I believe it's the Immaculate Conception in Revere, stuck my head in water, and there I was. Um, but, but I went to the nuns for the first five or six years and, and stayed active in the church for many years. And, and, and as it happens, had opportunities to work with Bishop McGuire when he was at Springfield, Bishop John Marshall up in Vermont for a while, and, and the late Bishop uh, uh, Angel up there. And, and so, uh, always had a chance to be in the periphery of, the, of what goes on. But never, for some reason, sat back and said, how long does it take to become a priest? And, you know, when you think about it, I, I was talking to Lucas, a young seminarian, who's going to be, it'll be nine years by the time he's ordained. And I said, wow. You know, and then my own brother, he went away when he was 14 uh, and, and was ordained, you know, it was eight or nine years for him. But he went to Siena College, St. Bonaventure's, in the Franciscan order, and ended up, you know, he speaks like five languages, and he, you know, he can do Gregorian chants and mm -hmm. did all kinds of things. But, but having seen all that, it, it's not something you just go to school for a couple of weeks 
and you get a nice little collar, you know, and a nice, nice new suit, and there you are. It's, it's, it's a lot of work and study. That's right. Depending on what the person's degrees are that they come in with, it's normally six to eight years before someone is ordained a priest. Wow. I mean, that's a lot of time and, and a big commitment. Yes. And, by the way, an extensive cost. It is, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I mention that because a lot of times we, we have these partners and charities and we hear these different things. And now you begin to realize what it actually costs to take a young man and get him to ordination. That's right. So if someone enters and they still have college that they need to complete, that's on them. The yeah. diocese expects them to pay for that on their yeah. own, to take out loans, right. whatever is necessary to do that. But once they begin the aspect that's actually studying towards the priesthood, the philosophy and the theology aspect, the Diocese of Worcester and many other dioceses wants the person to feel free to say, you know what, I tried this out for a year and it's not like I've taken on all this extra debt. It wasn't for me. I'm right. free to leave or I'm, I'm free to enter and try it out. I don't have to worry about where is this money gonna, going to come from. And so those six years of philosophy studies, two, two of philosophy and then four of theology is covered by the diocese. And that all comes out of the Partners in Charity collection that they right. do every year, which is most of what my budget that yeah. I have for all of the seminary expenses goes to their tuition. Wow. And, 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 and so you're working with these people. Uh, and I know you love to teach. I know you, do, you taught some courses this year. So it's going to give you an opportunity uh, to really work with these, these people and, and, and guide them through it. And, and I'm sure there's up and down days. I'm sure they're, they're, the days are, is this what I really want to do? Because it is a major commitment. Mm -hmm. you know? and, uh, and, and so I'm sure there's challenges for you who have to work with these these fellows and, uh, and get them through those days. Right. Now, fortunately, at each of the seminaries that we send to, the seminarian, the man studying to be yeah. a priest, is going to be assigned both a spiritual director, well, actually, he'll choose his spiritual director, I should say, and he'll be assigned a formation advisor. And these are the two people he'll meet with for the day-to-day -day discussion about, is this really for me? The spiritual director, more of the, the spiritual side of it, this is right. what I'm feeling in prayer when I think about this. And the formation advisor, in terms of, am I acquiring the skills necessary to do what it takes to be a priest? Uh, at the end of the year, they'll all be evaluated, and those will be sent to me to review with the, the man, but the day-to-day -day accompaniment takes place at the seminary. Right. Now, one of the things that I was surprised at um, is that, of course, I grew up, and everything was St. John's Seminary. If you're going to be a priest in the Diocese of Boston, that's where you went. And now I find out we have seminaries in in, in uh, Canada, we have was Baltimore has a seminary that our, our potential priests can go to many different places. Yes, depending on what their academic background is, or for various other reasons, the bishop might assign them to particular seminaries. So currently, the Diocese of Worcester has seminarians studying for the priesthood at St. John's Seminary in Brighton, Pope St. John the 23rd Seminary in Weston, which is for later vocations, so a right. second career. Then we also have a number of our seminarians down at St. Mary's in Baltimore. We have some at Theological College in Washington, D.C. We have some at the Pontifical North American College in Rome, and then some will be living with me at the Holy Name of Jesus House of Studies in Worcester. Wow. Now, how many of those did you go to? How many did I go to? Yeah, about. I spent two years at St. John's in Brighton, and then I was at the North American College in Rome. Rome. Now, did you enjoy Rome? I loved being in Rome. It was a wonderful experience. It was a long time, I must say, being over there. You know, you, you miss family. Yeah, yeah. You miss some of the comforts of yeah. American living, like you just start really craving ranch dressing yeah. or Doritos, things that are not yeah. as easy to come by. But the experience of being there to every day walk to class through this ancient city to be able to pop in and out of these churches to visit the tombs of the saints to be close to the pope i was there when pope benedict resigned when pope francis was elected i was in the square that night with actually with father bob gratterati from saint joseph's in charlton we were in the square together and it was just an amazing experience now did you well, you you were, you didn't know it you weren't no no you weren't you had no idea you were coming to charlton at that time um, there, 
there had been a long-standing rumor that eventually I was coming to Charlton. Charlton. Okay. But, I mean, we have no idea. But you when know, you were the there, you just happened these... to bump into him? No, he was on sabbatical, so he was there for three months. Yeah. And we really hit it off and connected. Oh, good. And so uh, the word was that he yeah. was going to ask, when he comes home, I want him to come to Charlton. So. Yeah. Well, that's good. But, but I mean, again, that's, I mean, you think about that, the opportunity just to see the Pope, you know. That's right. You know, and, and, and be in the, in, in what, as you grew up as a Catholic, was the, was the epitome of our church, is the Holy Father. And, That's right. uh, and I remember, because I've been around a long time, but I remember Pius XII and then go right up through the rest of the popes. We had one that only lasted about a month, poor fella. Uh, but, but all those different popes, and, the, and just as a layperson, the excitement when we were waiting for the white smoke to come up, you know, and, uh, and how the ancient traditions are still carried on. But to be there, when, standing there when it was announced, had to be exciting. It was. It was very exciting. And there were so many other events in the life of the church that we had the opportunity to attend. I remember, let's see, it would have been my third year over there uh, for the canonization of Pope John Paul II. Hundreds of thousands of people were coming to Rome yeah. to attend to this. And they said, there's no way you're going to get in. People were sleeping out in the streets yeah. so that they were first in line to get into the Mass. And I said, I'm not going to try to go through all of that. I, I rode the elevator to the top of our building, went to the rooftop, and I could see right into the square. And we couldn't hear, but no. we turned the radio on. We could yeah. hear it live. And we were there. We yeah. could see it all. Yeah. I know Father Bob tells a story. He had a chance to carry uh, Pope John the Twenty Third when he was when he was studying in Rome. Mm -hmm. They used to ride on that on the chair, yes, chair that so that everyone could see him nice see and high. Him. Yeah, and uh, Father Bob had the chance to uh, carry that one time. So he he still talks about that. But those are great opportunities, and and uh, so to be, to be in Rome. And, and the other thing is, as you go into your, your own ministry, you're able to share that with the, with the people you'll meet in, the, in a parish work, and even with the seminarians, you now have, you know exactly what it's like, because you did it, and you were there. And so, as they move through their own, you know, growth, you're able to share with them experiences that you had. That's right, and the, the learning was not just in the classroom, but the whole experience of being there at this international institute for theology. So we lived at the Pontifical North American College with all the guys from the states, but then we went out to the various Roman universities. So I was studying at the Gregorian University. And I remember one day, it was uh, in between classes, but everyone would go to the coffee bar, and I saw this, this sister that I knew, she was from Syria, and she went running by, and I tried to say hi to her, and it was very clear she was distracted, and she looked quite distraught. And I turned to my classmate, and I said, do you know something going on? And he says, no, I haven't heard anything. And a professor was right there, and he turned around, and he said, oh, you know, she's from Syria. And we said, yeah, we know, we know her. He says, well, her entire convent is in a town that ISIS just captured the other day, and they can't, they haven't heard from anyone. Oh, so she wow. doesn't, you know. And so when you see these people who come from different parts of the world as well, all Catholic, all yeah. very diverse experiences, you realize we truly have a universal church and that some of our priorities or concerns are really minutia in comparison yeah. to the great problems out there. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that because one of the things I, I, I get to crux and I get the reports every day and even, even as someone who's been around a long time, I'm beginning to understand that there's more to the Roman Catholic Church than the United States of America. Certainly. And, and, and yet we grew up and we think of us. You know, it's us. It's all about us. And, and then you realize the challenges that, that the Church faces and that the Holy Father faces with, with the, uh, uh, Chilean issues, with, with different issues. Now we have, we have some of these countries where the church is under attack, where they're, where they're blowing them up and, and chasing them and, and, and executing people. And uh, those are huge, huge concerns. And here we sit in our beautiful little world 
with our beautiful churches, and boy, aren't we special. And yet, some of the challenges, and, and, it, and it be, you begin to think of some of our own martyrs of our own church, you know, in the early days, mm -hmm. who gave up their lives, you know, who were tortured and, and, and burnt at the stake, uh, and it's happening today mm -hmm. in some of our countries. You know, so uh, you mentioned a story like that with that poor nun and, uh, and, and, and the devastation. I remember uh, Father Peter Precourt is an assumptionist, and when Jen and I were over at uh, St. Anne's and St. Patrick's, we lived in Sturbridge, um, they had a situation where uh, six of their priests were captured, mm. and they couldn't find them, and they were trying to reach them, and they were, you know, they, what happened to them, where did they go, and they were all trying to figure out ways to reach them and so forth. And uh, it, it really is, it's a, it's a, it's a huge challenge, and to your point, the universal church, and all the demands that can be made, you know, on one single person, uh, you know, and, and uh, he sits, you know, uh, I, I often wondered, you know, do you run for pope, <laughs> you know? And, You'd have to be crazy. Well, that's, yeah, most of them, when they get called on to do the job, say, me, uh, and, and, uh, and There's a room there in the papal apartments between the Sistine Chapel and where the Pope will put on for the first time the white cassock. There's this other room. It's called the Room of Tears. And it's called that because when they put the white cassock on for the first time, they realize what just happened. Yeah. And many of them begin sobbing. Yeah. And that's what takes so long for them to get out to the to balcony. Get, get out to the balcony. They're just overwhelmed with what they've realized. This is a huge responsibility. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you think about it and the size the church is, you know. But I, and again, I know a lot of us, we, we just think of the United States and, you know, our little world here. And, and we are privileged. And, and, and I think sometimes uh, we, some of our people, we, we need to be more grateful for how fortunate we really are. Um, that we are protected in the United States, where other countries where they're not protected, you know, and uh, and uh, and that and that is very very intriguing. Now, one of the questions someone asked me the other day, what what determines like, do you have to decide you want to be in Worcester, or is that decided for you? So there's different types of priests, right? I mentioned earlier the Franciscans, yeah. the Dominicans, and if someone joins up to join. If someone signs up to join one of those religious orders, yep. they are going to go where the order needs them. Yep. I'm a diocesan priest, which means I knew when I had that moment of clarity at BC, I'm yeah. supposed to serve where I came from, the local right. church, my local church family. Right. And so when I entered the seminary, I had signed up for the Diocese of Worcester. My studies were being paid for by the Diocese of Worcester. And then, in some sense, they own me, right? Yep. I will be assigned in the Diocese of Worcester for the rest of my priestly life, unless for some reason I'm asked to go outside of that. Right. The expectation is that I am going to serve here. Yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. I had a great friend, Father Joe McGinnis. And Father Joe, I, I grew up in Malden and after I moved from Everett to Malden when I was in the fifth grade. And I was at Sacred Hearts Parish. And in those days, we had a Monsignor and five priests, huge. There was 10 masses on a Sunday, up and downstairs. Couldn't get in, standing room only. But anyway, Joe came over and was involved with the kids. And so he became, I was involved in sports. And that's how I got to know him. And he became sort of the, the priest for our football team. And he, mm -hmm. We used to have a mass every Saturday morning before the game, he'd do a mass. But anyway, Joe was a Jesuit. And he taught at Boston College. And he, when I was chatting with him, I said, why'd you come? He says, I got burnt out. He said, I was teaching at Boston College and teaching at Boston College. And you get to a point where, okay, I've done this now for 12 years. Got to be something else, you know. And he said, the, the Jesuits, no, they wanted me to stay at the, oh, Joe, you're a great teacher. And, and he said, I just had that urge to get to parish work. So I went to see the Cardinal. And we worked out a transfer, so I transferred from the Jesuit order to the diocese and became a secular priest mm -hmm. and was assigned to Sacred Hearts. And, uh, and he loved it. I mean, he was, he, oh, he was just very popular priest, very fun guy, you know, and a lot of the Jesuits were a little more liberal 
than the uh, than the church was in those days, and so Joe made a lot of friends quickly because there was that element who wanted, you know, more, etc. And uh, but he really he really enjoyed getting into parish work. He just loved it because he said, you know, I had a chance to work with people. People had issues. Somebody wanted to get married. I could do a wedding. I could. Mm -hmm. He said so. It just became. I was so involved with with human beings who had different needs and, and wants than I was at, at Boston College teaching. You know, so it was, it was interesting. And, and, uh, and he really, really got into parish work. And another priest that was there at the same time was Father Daniel Hart. And it was his first assignment with Sacred Hearts. He later became an auxiliary bishop in Boston mm -hmm. and uh, then became the bishop in Norwich, Connecticut. Passed away about two years ago. But, but F Father Hart was another great young priest and, uh, that we knew and was, uh, was a great friend of the families. And when my mom passed away, uh, called me up and uh, came to the funeral and, and uh, didn't want to upstage the priest at Sacred Hearts, but sat on the altar for my mother. And, you know, it was, and he came to the wake the night before. and It was so great to see him. And, uh, uh, but it was, it was uh, uh, you know, interesting. And, and he was a young priest, you know, and just like yourself, and just started out and, uh, and moved quickly in the, in the ranks. Your parish life is, is where it's at, that's what yeah. I like to oh, say. Yeah. I love being in the parish, to go around and visit the religious ed classrooms, to go on a Friday night over to the high school, to watch yeah. football and support yeah. our young people, to walk outside and watch the diocesan volleyball league yeah. that plays at our parish now that we've got those uh, new sand volleyball yeah. courts that we just put in, all of these things wakes and funerals and yeah. weddings, baptisms, that's, it brings so much joy to be able to be at the most important moments of people's lives right. and to bring God into that situation yeah. for them. And I'm definitely going to miss that day-to-day -day interaction with people yeah. in the parish. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, you know, once you've done it and you enjoy it, you know, it's, it's tough to, I know my daughter, my youngest daughter was at the University of Rhode Island and Bishop Angel and I were, were, were meeting every month. And, and Kerry was in, there, and Bishop Angel had, before he left to come to Vermont, had put a young priest in the Newman Center at the University of Rhode Island. And he says, ha here, have Kerry call him up, because Kerry was struggling. You know. And uh, so she called him. And he, he ended up, she ended up helping him do the RCIA. She, she would help mm -hmm. him at the RCIA. And as you mentioned, she would go to the, they'd go, he'd go to the football game, and he, she'd go with him and take a bunch of kids. And she said, you know, she had so much fun. And, uh, and she was able to, and, and he used her to get more kids involved in the Newman Center. You know, uh, Carrie, if you've got friends, have them come over, come. You know, we got all kinds of things. So she really, you know, formed a relationship with him. And, uh, and, and you know, I, she still corresponds with him, and, uh, which was great. I mean, I, That's for, wonderful. for daddy, it was great, you know. That's wonderful. Uh, but, but to your point, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. Well, you're, you got, you're ready for a big challenge. I am ready. Have you, you, With have you God's been, grace, it can be done. Yeah. Now, you have obviously moved a lot of your, moved ready to go. I have actually completely moved out so that the room can get ready for the next priest who's coming right. into the right. rectory here. Right. So now you're going to be here this weekend. I'll be here this weekend. And then Monday you, you start your new duties. That's right. 7 a.m. Monday morning. Okay. Bright and early. Well, that's great. Well, Father Donato, I really want to tell you that number one, I, and I want to mention one thing, and I, I, I had a tough winter. I was in the hospital two or three times, and I don't know if you as a priest realize what happens, but you came in to visit me on a couple of occasions, and I'm sitting in bed, and you're just, you, you know, you're just laying there, and around the corner comes somebody you know, only this time it's Father Donato, and, and, and I, it was just as though you lifted me right up out of the bed. Uh, you know, spiritually and enthusiastically, wow, Father Donato's here. And I knew that you were going to bring me communion, and I knew that I would have a few seconds, you know, of peace and, and tranquility. And we said a little prayer together. And I don't know if, if, if you as a human being realize what you do to someone like little Dickie when you came in, you know, to see me and visit me. And it was, it was just, I'll never forget it. And, and, uh, and, and the three years you and I have known each other, you have really uh, helped me spiritually. I, I've just learned so much 
uh, from your from your own priesthood and the time you spent here at St. Joseph's. Uh, you know, you as you said, you're going to miss it. We're going to miss you. Miss it, yeah, and the people at the you. parish are wonderful. Yep, yeah. and we'll miss you. But that's beside the point. We'll come and see you, and I'm sure we'll our paths will cross again. Sounds like a plan. Good. Great. Thank you very much. There you are, the folks. There's another conversations with.